This episode is brought to you by Shopify. That's the sound of switching your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling. Harness the best converting checkout and same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Stop leaving sales on the table. Discover why millions trust Shopify to build, grow, and run their business. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech23. This episode is brought to you by Kia's first three-row all-electric SUV, the Kia EV9, with available all-wheel drive and seating for up to seven adults, with a zero to 60 speed that thrills you one minute, and available reclining lounge seats that unwind you the next. Visit kia.com slash EV9 to learn more. Ask your Kia dealer for availability. No system, no matter how advanced, can compensate for all driver error and or driving conditions. Always drive safely. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Please subscribe, leave a review, comment, share, and consider supporting the podcast on Patreon, even at the producer and sponsorship levels. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Ben Richardson about the impacts of COVID-19 on the learning and development industry. Ben Richardson, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you today. I'm super excited to be talking with you about the learning and development industry. We're both in this space, spend a lot of time and energy here, and I know you have a, have had a long storied career uh, in this space. We're going to be talking about it generally, but we're also going to be talking about the impacts of the pandemic and really the last two years of disruption and what that's had on the impact that that's had on the learning and development industry. As we get started, I wanted to share Ben's bio with everybody. Ben Richardson joined Go One in January as their chief content officer. As CCO, Ben will oversee internal and external content initiatives across multiple platforms to drive sales, engagement, retention, and positive customer behavior. He has more than a decade of experience in developing and implementing strategies that not only deliver business innovation, but also further strengthen brand messaging. Prior to Go One, Ben served as general manager and senior vice president at Viacom CBS and led the launch of the subscription streaming service Paramount Plus. What a tremendous background. Again, pleasure to have you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation for today? Um, well, it, it has been, you know, I've had a, quite a few decades of experience, definitely in the, in the media space. Um, and obviously it, it does seem like quite a quite a career pivot for me as well moving into the um into learning and development and particularly you know on the content um development side when it comes to to learning so i think it's uh um i'm on a steep learning curve so you know as we have this conversation today you know i think i will be able to talk from experience as a manager and as a learner and also you know i think i'm fresh enough to have, I suppose, a lot of reactions to to what I found and experienced as I've moved into the digital learning yeah. space. Yeah, well, interesting. And I just, if you don't mind me asking, and we can digress for just a minute from the main topic, your time at Viacom CBS and the launch mm. of Paramount Plus, Paramount Plus uh, super inter- interesting disruption, you know, in the industry when we talk about all these streaming services. And mm-hmm. everyone's kind of wrestling with each other to get the next, you know, service out and to to stay competitive. I'm wondering what the some of the biggest challenges were uh, that you and your team faced as you were trying to get Paramount Plus ready to go and launched. 
Yeah, well, I came from the Viacom side of the business. Um, so for your listeners, that was the business that ran the pay TV brands, Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central. So my background was in uh, audience. It was in, in content creation. It was in distribution and licensing. So it was a really, really broad sort of media remit. Um, but as, and and I think the the pandemic, the accelerant that it it created was people started to work from home and and we saw an acceleration of just consumption. If we look at the attention economy, people really started to spend a lot more time um, on on their media. And we've since seen that slow down to a point as people have started to come back into the office. But, you know, it was a uh, going into the pandemic, you know, I think while the plans to launch a streaming service were, were very much present, it did accelerate and I think investment in content, but also the challenges around creating content that really, really accelerated people. We could see consumption going up. And I felt like it, the moment had arrived when, you know, the business really accelerated from um, the legacy pay business to making sure that the business was led by streaming and, and subscriptions as well. So the challenges uh, was it's, it's an expensive arms race. Um, if you start to look at the investments that have been made in content in you know, the last two years, um, it's it's eye watering. The choice that we have as as consumers is is incredible. Um, and in the video space, unlike the audio space, um, you know, Spotify has been able to, and and Apple Music have been able to consolidate every song in one place. In in the video space, um, there is there is competition, there is exclusivity, and I think one of the bigger challenges is consumers having to shop around, having to move around, having to subscribe and unsubscribe to, to follow a show from one service to the other. Um, so, you know, it's been a, it, it, the, the rate of change was incredible. Consumers are well served, but now that I'm not in that business, I can see also um, it feels like we're heading towards another stage of consolidation as well. Um, and that's yeah. kind of been the interesting thing is coming into learning where it's still such a, it, by necessity, a fragmented yeah. and, and complex ecosystem. Media is, media is shrinking. The, the, the cost of entry is just enormous. Mm -hmm. um, as consumers, we're the winners, but I think, you know, it's, it's, it, we are entering a, a, a period of rapid change. Yeah, well, you, you refer to it as the arms race of content creation. <laughs> mm. And I think that's a really great way to, to frame it up. And I, I can't help but just think about my own personal experience and that of my family as, as things got locked down early COVID days, March of 2020. Um, you know, we're not going out, we're not spending money on live entertainment, we're not going out to eat, we're like we're just all together at home. Mm. And of course, you know, we end up watching more shows and binging shows. And, and I will admit that this isn't Paramount Plus, but um, Netflix, uh, I was definitely an early adopter to Tiger King. Um, mm. And, you know, so I, I'm like, this is a weird, fascinating show. I'm not sure I would have ever watched it otherwise. But it was just kind of an escape. And I watched it. And that's just an one kind of little point uh, of info about, you know, laying out this overall picture uh, that you're describing of, of just content consumption. And yeah. I will, you know, fast forwarding a couple of years or whenever it was that the second season of Tiger King came out, I had zero interest in watching it. <laughs> like I didn't watch it. So the yeah. time had passed um, and I had adjusted and my family had adjusted and we were, you know, our time and energies were spent on other things. Um, but everyone continues over the last couple of years, the amount of money spent in the content space to create mm -hmm. more materials for the streaming services is, is, is mind blowing. And as you said, you've made the transition over to the learning and development industry and the learning and development space. The content there has, the, the amount of, of investment there has also been eye-popping uh, over yeah, the last yeah. couple of years uh, with super fragmented, like everyone and their dog, you know, creating mm -hmm. learning and development materials. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and this is wonderful in a lot of ways because it's driving down price. For consumers, it's lots of really wonderful content, a lot of free content, a lot of inexpensive content uh, that people can use to reskill and upskill. All of that is tremendous. Uh, and yet we'll, we'll still have to figure out long term what this is going to look like uh, moving into the future, whether that's, you know, various forms of consolidation uh, or whatever. Uh, and that's really where I want to go next. You know, we can, mm -hmm. we can dig into talking more specifically about the ins and outs of learning and development and, and the industry. But I'm also, you know, maybe first we can talk about the impacts of this acceleration into content creation over the last couple of years due to the pandemic and COVID. Mm -hmm. um, 
what, and, and now that you're in this new position, as you said, this new learning curve, you're, you're uh, in this space, what have you seen with fresh eyes coming into the space and, and where do you see things going, say in the next couple of years? My observation is the the radical change that the content creators have undergone. You know, my experiences on on the other side as a, as a general manager were most most of that training was in person. You know, you had a broad range of experts. Some you'd worked with, you'd bring them into a room and you'd gather 10, 20 um, employees and and do an in person training session over a longer period of time. And and that was the default. You know, and with the pandemic, all of those trainers who've come from such a range of backgrounds and have, have built these really nice, often very small and very organic businesses, they had to pivot drastically because suddenly there wasn't a workplace to come from. So my first observation was the amount of change that these creators have gone through. And I appreciate there were a lot already, you know, creating digital learning. and and But for many, they'd gone from in-person to digital, having to um, acquire a huge number of skills themselves to be able to present that uh, that same experience, that authentic ex- experience, the um, engaging experience in a, in a digital format. They had to learn how to create it. They had to learn how to distribute it, and, and, and all these and all these challenges they had to they had to solve for in a really really short space of time. Where now digital learning is the default. You can't imagine an industry just going through such rapid change where suddenly you know digital is now the default and and that from as an outsider coming in is just an incredible amount of change to comprehend just the accumulation of skills as the 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 trainers have had to become retrained and upskilled themselves and and so as I observe that you know and if you think of the early stages of the pandemic where we suddenly got used to to working um in zoom and teams and and out and the world shifted so radically and pivoted so radically um, that, you know, the learning and development industry has gone, it feels like it's been at the forefront of a lot of that change. You know, we're used to being entertained in a certain way, but train, training just radically, radically shifted. So, you know, that was one of the big observations for me. Um, and, you know, I think fortunately the employer I joined, Go One, you know, we, we have the world's biggest learning library. We were fortunately in the right place to really benefit from, from that change and from that, from that move to remote working allowed us to sort of really be at the right place at the right time and and um so I've landed in the right place I'm overwhelmed by the amount of change and evolution that's gone on in the industry and I'm really invested in in where it goes from here you know we've it's hard to force this much change on on organizations and communities isn't it without something like a pandemic it's just unprecedented it's incredible uh to think about uh the adoption of these new technologies and this new modality for delivering of learning and development. The, the training mm-hmm. industry has gone through that huge shift. And, and as you mentioned, clearly there were organizations that had digital, you know, e-learning content before. Uh, I'm a university professor in addition to my consulting work. And so in the learning and development space, I've, I've done, you know, my own work uh, for a long time, but I also have taught in the university space as a full-time professor for a long time. And the university is a good uh, case in point on this. Did we have online programs before? Yes. Did we have online courses before? Yes. Were they any good? That's another question. Were they engaging? Were they, uh, or, or were, were they kind of like a, a bare minimum uh, version of the traditional in-person classroom? And it depended, right? It depended on, on the professor and, and what they really put into their online learning. <clears throat> but ultimately, what we found uh, over the last couple of years is everyone was forced, all professors, the whole university was forced to invest in training to help them learn how to better deliver uh, uh, online learning content. And in many cases, what we used to think about in terms of that online learning, uh, in terms of s- asynchronous learning, we now have have reframed and recognized that you can do synchronous virtual online learning uh, very effectively. And in fact, that's something that I hadn't done a lot of prior to the pandemic. I've done tons of leadership development trainings and in-person trainings. I've done asynchronous online trainings for years. I've done all of that. 
And it really, it wasn't until the last couple of years that this, this new synchronous online modality opened up widely uh, for a much larger number of people. And I say that as someone who's been enmeshed in the space for a really long time, and it still wasn't something I was very involved in. Well, now everyone is involved in anyone who's involved in the learning space. They have had to figure out how to be effective doing it virtually and whether that's synchronous, asynchronous, whatever, some sort of hybrid approach. Um, and so that's a good thing and, and a, a challenge. Obviously it's a, it's a great thing to have new skills in your tool belt. It's a great thing to have, um, you know, different types of modalities that suit and, and meet different needs in different contexts. Uh, and it's, and it's fantastic also to be able to have expanded reach, to be able to, um, to be able to have more accessibility to a wider audience, because you don't have to bring everyone physically together in one space, uh, that you can serve many more individuals uh, because of the virtual component, yet it still continues to have a different dynamic than being together mm. in person. So, you know, all of these things are pros and cons. Um, I, I just wanted to, to highlight what you've been saying that I've seen it. I've seen that shift over the last couple of years. I've experienced it personally. I've seen it in the lives of other professionals, other consultants, others in the training, uh, learning and development space. And uh, I think more is coming because, you know, we, we continue to have disruptive technologies and, and whether or not this pandemic thing is replaced by the next pandemic or the next disruption or just technological advances, we're going to continue to see this uh, arrangement that we have become more accustomed to shift over time. You're going to have things like the metaverse. You're going to have virtual uh, reality training sessions and those sorts of things that I honestly haven't really wrapped my mind around totally. And I'm not really sure what that'll look like. Any thoughts on some of those kind of out there in the next five, 10 years uh, technical developments that will change this industry even further. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Academy. Courses, micro credentials, and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. All HCI Academy courses, micro-credentials, and certificates are designed, developed, and delivered by award-winning and internationally renowned scholars, educators, thought leaders, executives, and practitioners. Our courses, micro-credentials, and certificates will help you make your mark on the future of work and make an immediate impact in your organizations. Check out the HCI Academy and our many course offerings and certificates to upskill and reskill for the future of work. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free, interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. So, I mean, even even a shorter time frame, I am uh, have been doing a bit of a roadshow. I'm just around Australia at the moment um, to, to talk to the future of, of Go One's learning experience. And so at Go One, we are not um, creators of content per se. We, we do invest um, where we need to fill a gap, but really in the business of creating tools to allow our creators to to deliver content that is more immersive and engaging engaging so if we talk about um virtual reality so go one has made an investment in a, a company called tailspin it's a us-based company and the creators actually came from the um the special effects industry in hollywood to be honest and so they had that experience and they're applying that to learning so um 
they call it extreme learning or extreme reality. And it covers, you know, you can, you can do it um, training, whether it's through a browser or with a headset, you know, like, like the Oculus or the, the hopefully soon to be launched Apple um, headset as well. The, the statistics behind immersive learning are really, really impressive. It's, you know, um, there was a Stanford study which showed that immersive learning is 76% um, more effective. People learn faster, they're more focused, um, they're more emotionally connected. Where, where virtual reality, I think, applies to learning and I think where it's effective, it's really in allowing learners to rehearse um, conversations. It, it's so, what the experience looks like is if you are, uh, have a headset on, you're in a room with an avatar and you may be interviewing a person, you may be doing a performance review, you may be training a sales team, but in this training environment, you get real-time feedback. So in an interview environment, you ask the questions of three very different looking candidates and you ask from a, a drop-down menu of questions, you know, each interview is different and you get feedback immediately. How did you approach them? What bias did you demonstrate? Uh, where could you have been more effective in that conversation? So to me, this is a really, really exciting development and it will actually be realised sooner rather than later. Um, so with Tailspin, they have created a tool. So I always um, compare it to say a garage band or, or an iMovie, which is a simple to use no code tool. So the creators will have access to this tool and they'll be able to adapt and evolve their learning and develop um, virtual experiences. For the learner, the benefit is you get to have those real-time conversations, those difficult conversations. If I think about my uh, journey as a manager, I was probably thrown in the deep end, as were most people of my, of my generation, I'd say. And so you made mistakes in real time. You know, those first performance management conversations, those difficult conversations, those challenging conversations with a manager, you, they played out in real time. With immersive learning, you get to rehearse, you get to rehearse, you get to fail. And so I think this is going to be one of the most exciting things that will be um, coming to the learning and development space. It, it is here, but I think it's going to see some rapid um, evolution as well. So that's one of the things that we're really exciting about. We're developing 10 modules, you know, focused on better communication, um, exploring diversity and inclusion, identifying bias, developing emotional intelligence, leading through uncertainty. So these will all be all be modules where the learner can actually get to practice in real time, get feedback and not make perhaps the errors that, that I made as a, as a developing manager. Um, and I think they'll be much better off um, yeah. as a result. So it's a tool we're actively developing, developing. It's something I'm really excited about. Whenever we talk to our customers about it, they're really excited as well because, you know, they, you know, our, the, our customers are, are experiencing, they're at the coalface of, of a very, very different workplace and a, a workplace that's shifted so radically. So I think this is going to be a really exciting um, development and I think Go One's going to be able to take a leadership position. Yeah, that, well, that's super cool. And again, I, I, I can't help but think about, well, what does this mean for my own personal uh, work that I do in the training, learning, and development space, both on the corporate side, but also in the university space in traditional academic coursework? Uh, there's always going to be a, a place for in-person learning, uh, whether in the, on the corporate side or in the academic, you know, uh, traditional brick and mortar university setting. But more and more, people really are craving that flexibility and the, the accessibility that comes through uh, these various high engagement kinds of online learning opportunities. So this virtual reality approach, uh, high fidelity opportunities to connect with other people uh, in meaningful ways in a live format, I think that's going to play a tremendous role moving forward. And I know for myself that that's something I'm definitely going to have to pay more attention to. I'm going to have to uh, reskill and up my upskill myself a bit. And I, I have tons of training in this space. I, I know what I'm doing yet. I'm not fully, you know, aware of all of the emerging technologies. And I, I suspect I'm not the only one. So there's a lot of us out there that need to do more work in this space so that we're ready for the next wave. And we're ready to, uh, to leverage that as an opportunity, not just see it as, you know, a challenge that we have to respond to. 
Well, and Ben, I'll oh, go re-skilling ahead. And, I would just say reskilling and upskilling have always been present in our lives. I'm sure you as well. I, yeah. I, I, I trained as a projectionist of film. I remember when I used to, you know, edit film with with a glue and, and, and a cutter. And, and so if I look back on my life, there has been this constant um, upskilling and reskilling. It just is getting faster. You know, there are more tools at our disposal and it is overwhelming. And so, you know, that's what we're trying to solve for at Go One. Yeah, it is getting faster and faster, and I only anticipate that trajectory continuing. <laughs> um, I, I don't see it slowing down anytime soon. So we we have to to uh, be adaptable and just adopt a growth mindset that we're constantly stretching ourselves and learning. And if we try to dig in our heels and try to just do things the way we've always done them, because that's what we're comfortable with, even if it's because we think that's really what the best way is, we're going to find ourselves left out. Uh, mm, of right. the shifts that occur. And it, it's just inevitable. Well, Ben, it has been a real pleasure talking with you. I know at the time I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. But before we wrap up for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work at Go One and your team, uh, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Thank you. So you can find me on LinkedIn, of course. Um, but if you want to find out more about what Go One are doing what we're developing, goone.com. Um, we have uh, newsletters, podcasts, um, blogs. You know, I, I think, you know, we've got a really, really active um, uh, num- bunch of creators who are really constantly telling and refreshing our story, highlighting our content, talking about developments in the industry. So, you know, if you go to our website, you will, you will be able to stay very much up to date with what we're doing. Um, my final thought is, um, you know, Go One may not have the the presence um, or the awareness in particularly in in the American and European markets, but you know, it, this is a really really impressive business, you know, and I think it's I joined them because of they had so many great things going for them, so much potential, but a beautiful mission, you know, unlock positive potential through a love of learning, and I think that. Um, that in itself is is a fantastic um, premise for us to really continue to sort of evolve and integrate into organizations everywhere. And really the beneficiaries are organizations and learners. The beneficiary is, sim- is, is simplicity. We're saving for time and, and delivering great value. So I'm really excited to have joined this industry. I'm really excited about its potential and where it's going. And I can just see so um so much to come in sh- such a short space of time. You know, the pandemic has been an accelerant and I think yeah. everyone's going to be a benefit of that as well in the, in the learning space in particular. So thank you. Um, love to connect with you, with your listeners. Um, and, and thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Ben. It's been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Ben can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Check out my new book, The Future Leader, Creating and Transforming Next-Gen Organizations. Stemming from two decades of professional experience and over 600 in-depth interviews with executives, thought leaders, and scholars from across the globe, The Future Leader will help you explore the ordinary, everyday actions that will help you to prepare to lead in the future of work, to respond to an uncertain future, and to produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There is no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of your problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Alchemy of Truly Remarkable Leadership, 
ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.